stood yelling crucify and it breaks our hearts every time for Jesus death occurs every time someone is ignored mistreated oppressed crucify tears away at God's beloved
tonight is from John chapter 18, verses 1 through 12. After Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, Whom are you looking for? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again, he asked them, Whom are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. Put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their officer, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. Oh. 
First they took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest, but Peter was standing outside the gate. So the other disciple who was known to the high priest went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing around it, warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face, saying, Is, it, is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, You are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it, and at that moment, the cock Crowed. Let us all come together for our prayer of reconciliation. Ever present God, on this Good Friday night, our whole world is engulfed in shadows as we remember the story of Jesus' death. We confess that we want to push the fast-forward button on this familiar story because it hurts so much. It hurts to think of the betrayal and arrest of Jesus. It hurts to imagine Jesus abandoned and suffering on the cross with only a faithful few watching him breathe his last breath. It hurts to watch your light overtaken by the shadows of the world, but we must find our place in this crucifixion story and feel the pain that is there, the pain of the world, of faithless decisions, of betrayal, of injustice. Jesus entered that pain out of faithfulness to you and to us, to witness to the truth that is justice, wholeness, and love. We confess we are afraid to enter this pain with Jesus. Strengthen us with your courage. Offer glimpses of hope in the shadows of death. Let us know you are present with us here in this moment of pain now as always. Beloved followers of Jesus, it is okay to feel hurt and uncomfortable as you enter into this story and imagine your place in it. Know that God meets you in the story with comfort as well as challenge, with courage as well as love. Amen.
Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, so you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him, but you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out. Wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die because he has claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you know that I have the power to release you and the power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Drew Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king, sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. 
He said to the Jews, here is your king. They cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate asked them, shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, we have no king but the emperor. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. 
Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. Let us pray. Ever-present God, we are amazed that Jesus, nearing his death, reached out to comfort and empower those dearest to him. At the foot of his cross, he called his mother and his beloved disciple into a new community. Give us the grace and courage to join them there, welcoming all who struggle and grieve into this new covenant of love and grace. For whom shall we pray in our world, our community, our family, under the shadow of the cross? At this time, lifting up prayer concerns out loud is encouraged or silently at your own discretion. My family, Grace United Methodist Church, those who have died for their faith, those who hunger those who are lost and lonely, those who suffer, amen.
After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who has testified so that you also may believe his testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. Tonight, as we gather in this space, we are surrounded by discomfort. We are surrounded by darkness, and we are surrounded by pain. It's so much easier for us to jump from Palm Sunday to Easter to resurrection to joy and light and flowers and eggs and all things pretty but without this night, this Good Friday, none of us would be here. None of us would be able to claim our faith because our God came to us in a very real and powerful way. I want to share with you to begin a reflection written by Shane Claiborne. He is a progressive evangelical, and he is someone who resides in inner city Philadelphia. He spends his life working to speak for those whose voice cannot be heard. He speaks for reform, for, for justice, and he speaks so that God may be lifted up. Here are his words. We call it Holy Week, but it was a terrible week. His trial reeked of injustice. His own disciples sold him out for a few pieces of silver, betrayed him with a kiss, and hung himself. As he was arrested, one of his closest friends disregarded all his teachings on love, pulled out a knife, and cut a guy's ear off. Jesus called him out and healed the other guy. A lot of the stuff that happened that first holy week was pretty unholy. Once arrested, he was passed back and forth between politicians and bureaucrats. There was Caiaphas the priest, the Sanhedrin council, Pontius Pilate, the crowd, everyone seemed to want him dead, but no one wanted blood on their hands. Even Pilate washed his clean. They had all kinds of accusations. Insurrection, 
inciting a riot, conspiracy, terrorism, plotting to destroy the temple, blasphemy. But all he did was love and heal and give people hope. Despite any substantial evidence, witnesses, or signs of any crime committed, he was pronounced guilty and sentenced to die. As he awaited his fate, he was bullied, interrogated, harassed, tortured, beaten to a pulp. The authorities humiliated him and stripped him naked. They mocked the claims of his divinity, ramming a crown of thorns onto his head and wrapping him in a pur royal purple robe as they laughed. And so it went. This man who many believe was the Holy One that the prophets spoke of, the long-awaited Messiah, God incarnate, love with skin on, was executed brutally. He died with his body convulsing as his lungs collapsed, with vultures swarming overhead, hoping to clean up after the execution. There is nothing more evil than what happened that good Friday. Most of his friends deserted him and left him to fend for himself. Some of them were so scared they denied even knowing him. Only the women stayed. The long loneliness was so agonizing, so gut-wrenching. He felt like God had bailed on him. Among his last words were these, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But even though it was a gruesome week, love gets the last word. We call it Good Friday because it wasn't just the death that made the news, but resurrection. The empire, the cross, the bloodshed was not the end of the story. On the cross, Jesus made a spectacle of evil. He exposed the hatred that we are capable of, and he triumphed over that hatred with love. He died with forgiveness on his lips just as he came to set the oppressed free, he also came to set oppressors free. Holy Week is not just about the resurrection. It is also about the cross. Without Good Friday, there is no Easter. But we can't leave Jesus on the cross in the end, this is a resurrection story. Holy Week is about a God who suffers with us, bleeds with us, cries with us, hopes with us. As we celebrate Holy Week, let's connect the passion of Christ with the passion of the streets. As we remember the violence inflicted on Jesus, we remember the crucified peoples of our world, the victims of violence today. One of the most powerful Good Friday services we've ever had was a few years ago. We carried the cross into the streets and planted it outside the gun shop in our neighborhood. We had our services there. We read the story of Jesus' death and heard about the woman, the women weeping at the foot of the cross. And then we listened to the women in our neighborhood weep as they shared about losing their kids to gun violence. 
Calvary met Kensington. Afterwards, one woman said to me, I get it, I get it. I asked her what she meant. And then she said something more profound than anything I ever learned in seminary. God understands my pain. God knows how I feel. God watched his son die too. Then I realized that she was a mother of a 19-year-old who had just been murdered on our block. God understands our pain. That is good theology for Good Friday. And that kind of theology only happens when we connect the Bible to the world we live in. It happens when worship and activism meet. We don't have to choose between faith and action. In fact, we cannot have one without the other. As the end of Shane's reflection, and this evening I felt it important to hear those words, important to lift up what he was speaking about, because for all of us, Good Friday is a remembrance that God comes to us in a very real and powerful way. A way unlike anything we can describe or fully understand. It is indeed a holy mystery, but this is the day that God incarnate, our Emmanuel, chose to die with us chose to live out the brokenness of this world, recognizing that he would go to any lengths to show God's love and compassion, even death upon a cross. We serve a God who came to this earth, a God who came in sometimes the most absurd way we can think of, a little baby, who cried, had dirty diapers, scraped his knee, cried out for his mother, played, grew up into a man who studied God's word, a man who sought to spread love, to spread justice, compassion, grace who wasn't afraid to get his hands dirty, wasn't afraid to be with the people that the world deemed unholy or less than. In fact, that's where he felt the most comfortable. This is the God whom we serve, the God that comes to us in the absurdity of life, a God who knows your pain who knows our pain and journeys with us because we are never alone. This good Friday shows us that we are never alone, no matter what we are experiencing, no matter how bleak or how hard things are, that we have a God that goes with us even unto death a God that will journey and will be there, a God who lives and dies for us, knowing that grace and wholeness are possible. But this night, we don't lift up the resurrection. We must sit in our discomfort We must sit in the unease and the doubt and the grief of what happened on this day so many years ago. For we are a part of that story. We are guilty, we are broken, and we are called to sit with that, to ask forgiveness 
and to seek after God as we know that God seeks after us. Amen. Our sixth of the shadows is from John 19, 38 through 42. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission So he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices and linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there.